answer. In order to preserve time, we ask that you please keep questions brief and we'll be taking all questions at the end of the call. I please welcome the Vegas Chamber President and CEO, Mary Betsy Walt. Thank you so much, Carlos. I really appreciate all your work. And thank you everybody for joining us today as we partner with the Nevada Business Information Network and State Labor Commissioner Shannon Chambers today to bring you new information about returning back to work. Uh, Commissioner Chambers, thank you so much for joining us. I'm sorry we can't see your beautiful face today, but we appreciate you being here. Thank you very much, Mary Beth. And again, thank you to the Las Vegas Chamber. And I really appreciate the opportunity to speak to your group again and wanted to kind of give you a perspective on some of the issues that we have seen as people have returned to work. And obviously some of the issues that are ongoing for those employees that were employed uh, full-time and part-time throughout this whole period. But just kind of wanted to regroup with your group and tell you some of the things that we're seeing in terms of claims and complaints coming to our office and again try and provide the best information that we can knowing that some of these issues are still kind of a moving target and our office again just wants to provide the best guidance that we can on these issues and knowing that certainly there's no easy answers to some of these questions but again at least want to kind of provide a framework for employers to work with and where they can go to get guidance and have their questions answered okay. so again thank you Oh my gosh, our pleasure and thank you for your time. We really appreciate it. We know you have a lot of information. Just real quickly before we get to that, I wanna thank our webinar sponsors today, SCE Federal Credit Union and the UNLV Executive MBA Program. We appreciate their generous support so much uh, in helping the Vegas Chamber bring this great and timely information to our members and we couldn't do it without them. Also wanna just highlight a couple of Vegas Chamber programs uh, next week. We're really excited about this. The Vegas Chamber and the LVGEA are teaming up again for our joint Washington, D.C. fly-in. This year, it's going all virtual, and we're bringing D.C. to LV. That's going to take place September 14th through the 17th, of course, with our general, uh, our typical series of, of meetings with decision makers and then policymakers on Capitol Hill. Now more than ever, we all need to have a united voice, so it's really important that you participate uh, in our fly-in. Today is the last day to register, so if you're interested in joining us, go to VegasChamber.com. Last week, uh, another announcement. Last week, we announced the U.S. Bank as a brand new coaching program. It's the U.S. Bank Coaching and Growth Center at the Vegas Chamber. We're very excited about that. It's a new member benefit that gives you and your employees access to free goals coaching um, and professional life coaches as well, so it's a great way for you to set up um, for you to get set and set up your personal and professional goals. And again, uh, if you're interested in that, go to VegasChamber.com. And then last but not least, uh, on Friday, September 18th from 11 to 12, we're going to host the grand opening of the very first of its kind, uh, at the Employee in the Business Hub at the Vegas Chamber. We're really excited about this. It's a partnership between Workforce Connections, um, Nevada's Department of Employment, Training and Rehabilitation, and Nevada's Department of Business and Industry, and of course, the Vegas Chamber. So that's going to give businesses an access uh, to access to a range of employment services like training, recruitment, um, and even tax credits to help you with your talent needs. So we really look forward to that partnership. All right. And now with any further, without any further ado, uh, Madam Commissioner, we're going to welcome you once again to the program. Commissioner Shannon Chambers, Nevada State Labor Commissioner, thank you again for joining us. And uh, let's get right into your presentation. Great, thank you very much. So again, thank you all for having me and allowing me to speak to your group again. And I'm gonna start um, on slide number eight. So the increase in the minimum wage, for those of you that don't know, the minimum wage did go up on July 1st, 2020. That was passed during the last legislative session and the labor commissioner was asked by many entities and not to name names but to delay the raise in the minimum wage the labor commissioner certainly has some power but does not have the power to override the nevada legislature so the minimum wage did go increase did go into effect on july 1st 2020 and again nevada has that unique two-tier minimum wage requirement where if you are offered qualified health benefits, you can pay the lower tier. If you are not offered qualified health benefits, you have to pay the higher tier. So currently those rates are $8 an hour if you are not offered qualified health benefits and $9 an hour 
if you are not offered qualified health benefits. Sorry. Um, so $8 if you're offered qualified health benefits, $9 if you're not offered qualified health benefits. A couple points I want to make about Nevada minimum wage and kind of in context with the federal law. In Nevada, you cannot take a tip credit off of the minimum wage. So as the COVID-19 events kind of unfolded and the federal government rolled out different programs and financial programs to assist employers um, to stay in business, mainly the PPP. So that was a program to help small businesses uh, make payroll and different things like that. Our office started seeing a lot of complaints regarding tip structures and tip pooling and credit card fees being taken from the tip, quote unquote, tip pool or the tip amounts that employees usually were supposed to get. So we work individually with those businesses and with those restaurants through those issues, but just know that while the federal government and the Paycheck Protection Program, PPP, may have its own requirements, you still have to comply with Nevada law when it comes to minimum wage and when it comes to tips. So Nevada law is very clear that you cannot offset the minimum wage with tips. Federal law is different and certainly appreciate that that becomes confusing, uh, but we saw quite a few of uh, claims and complaints coming in from employees because the tip structure changed. And my comment to that for an employer is you certainly have the right to change your tip structure and how that's going to work, but you need to inform employees about that and make sure they're aware of that. Because unfortunately, when they see their check or they see a credit card fee or they see something that's different that didn't exist there before, and certainly, you know, some of these things didn't exist there before, it's just informing those employees about it and making sure they're aware of it. But again, just be reminded that the federal requirements and those federal programs may have different requirements, but you still need to comply with state law when it comes to minimum wage and not offset minimum wage through tips. And that is an issue that um, I can say in my tenure as the labor commissioner, I have seen more of that in the past six months than I ever saw um, in the past five years. So just be aware of that. Again, many people are making over minimum wage and this is not an issue, but um, just wanted to bring that to all of your attention because it does seem to be an issue that is ongoing. And obviously with employers, having to bring people back and having to cut costs in some areas and maximize staff. Um, again, we are seeing some issues in terms of minimum wage and trying to offset minimum wage and not pay minimum wage or use different kind of funding sources to make up that difference. So again, you still have to comply with Nevada law and still have to pay the minimum wage. So let's go ahead and go to the next slide, Carlos. So Nevada being unique in many different respects with our two-tier minimum wage system that also impacts overtime. So Nevada has that unique rule where if you work over eight hours in a 24-hour period, and right now if you're making less than $12 an hour offered qualified health benefits, then you are entitled to overtime over eight hours in a 24-hour period. That is a unique Nevada law. Um, a lot of people do not like that law. The Labor Commissioner certainly has her own feelings about that law and has discussed potential changes about that requirement, and we'll have to see how that plays out in the next legislative session, but it is a unique requirement in Nevada law, and it does impact people who are working shifts. It does impact small businesses disproportionately, and I will tell you that honestly that if you have one or two employees, it's hard to rotate shifts to avoid um, that overtime requirement. So having an employee there over eight hours, um, then having them come in the next day to trigger that overtime requirement. So again, it still is the law, it still is in effect. Um, again, whether the labor commissioner likes it or not, and whether it creates confusion, um, it does, but we try and work through it and give the best guidance we can. And for those of you who are 
operating multiple employees on different shifts and they are making $12 an hour offered qualified health benefits or less than that, or making less than $13.50 if they're not offered qualified health benefits, we would ask that you certainly contact us and we'll walk you through a schedule and we'll walk you through a week so that you can avoid kind of that trap where you get the over, um, over eight hours in a 24 hour period and then you owe overtime for the whole week. So there is an exception to that, and that's the four tens exception. So the employees work uh, four days, 10 hours a day. Um, that does have to be agreed to, and it does have to be signed off by the employee. There is an advisory opinion on our website about that, where if there's weather or something happens where the employee cannot work, the 410 shift on how to deal with that. Um, that is an advisory opinion, and that was revised a couple of years ago. But if you have a 410 schedule, you definitely need to stick with it. So the most common sense overtime rule is over 40 hours in a week. So over 40 hours in a week pretty much is the standard that does apply, taking out the over eight hours in a 24-hour period. Again, you have to make sure that if you're going to have employees that are working over 40 hours a week that you do pay them that overtime that you do document it we have seen a trend in the past four or five months where a lot of employers and these are for employees who are making more than minimum wage and more than one and one half the minimum wage so they're making more than 12 dollars an hour they're making more than 13 dollars and 50 cents per hour we're seeing a lot of employers move employees into salary exempt positions so that they are technically not eligible for overtime. My comment on that is Nevada law is very specific and it's Nevada revised statute section 608.018. There are very specific requirements on who is exempt for, from overtime. So you can't just call anybody salary exempt. There are certain positions, certain requirements that have to be met. So the big one we're seeing right now is employers have moved employees saying they're salary exempt, classifying them as administrative, professional, or executive. So those have very specific requirements under federal and state law. Simply because somebody's in an administrative position, and I'm saying like somebody who's like a receptionist or somebody who's, you know, processing documents or different things like that. Administrative, the definition has very specific requirements. The salary exempt exemption is mainly intended for quote unquote white collar professionals, executives, um, administrative. So you have to look at the duties. So we have had many, many complaints over the past four months and how they come in is, you know, I used to be hourly, I'm now salary exempt. I'm now being asked to work 70 hours a week. Can't I get overtime? So I'm just giving you an example of these are exactly how they come into our office. We do conduct investigations. We ask the questions. We talk to the employers. You know, when did you make this change? What are their actual duties? The Nevada Labor Commissioner takes a little bit different approach on these types of cases. We ask the employer to go back and do a self audit. So if we find that the duties that this employee is actually performing do not meet the requirements for overtime exempt, we will ask the employer to go back and do a self audit and fix it. Um, the federal government takes a little bit different approach on these types of cases, and I just bring that up, that this is one area where you really need to be careful, and if you have the ability to consult with, like, the Las Vegas Chamber or with an employment attorney, if you're going to classify your employees as salary exempt, you really need to make sure that they truly meet those requirements for an exemption. And, you know, if you are just going to say that everybody's salary exempt to try and avoid overtime, I would not recommend that course of action. And like I said, we have been conducting a lot of um, investigations and asking employers to go back and do a self audit. And that's the way we prefer to handle it. Um, that's not to say that we don't on occasion 
impose administrative penalties if we see very egregious situations where you know it's been going on for a long time or it truly is something that's intentional but again we're happy to answer those questions and if you're considering changing somebody to salary exempt um, again reach out to our office or reach out to you know an organization like the chamber or a labor attorney to make sure that you're doing that right because I can tell you on the federal side, there have been some extremely large, large cases where they have gone after businesses for abusing that salary exempt um, exemption and the penalties and the wages have been huge. So just be aware of that and definitely wanted to bring that up because we're seeing that more and more and more. So let's go ahead and go to the next slide, Carlos. So non-standard deductions, seeing a lot of claims and complaints about this as well over the past six months. So in Nevada, Nevada law, again, is very, very specific. If you're going to take a deduction, and I'm not talking about child support or alimony or something that's court ordered, talking about a voluntary deduction, it has to be in writing for a specific purpose, pay period, and the amount. You cannot have a blanket deduction. So the labor commissioner has been very flexible in saying, okay, if we know it's going to be $100 per month for the next 12 months, you can certainly have one agreement that says, you know, employee XYZ is gonna take $100 out of John Smith's paycheck for the next 12 months and have that employee sign off on that so that you don't have to do that every month but you cannot have a blanket authorization. So seeing that more and more and more, um, seeing deductions for items related to COVID-19. So, you know, deductions for masks, deductions for cleaning supplies, and the labor commissioner, and we'll get into a little bit later, has said that you should not be deducting those types of expenses from the employee's paycheck. But again, seeing that more and more and more, and Again, our approach is we want to work with the employer and just tell them to stop doing that and give them the opportunity to fix that. But again, if you're going to have a deduction, it needs to be specific, needs to be in writing, and the employee needs to sign for it. And when we go out and do an investigation, and this leads to the second uh, topic here, record keeping, if there are no records and the worst situation we ever want to be in is where it's a he said she said or she said she said if there are no records on the employer side as a regulator we're going to tend to lean um, against that employer and say you were required to keep records and you didn't in nevada you have to keep the basic employer employee records for two years so that's your wages your salaries your deductions how many hours they worked now with paid leave you do need to keep um, some tracking of the paid leave on that too but you have to keep records they can be electronic but the worst situation for us is if we get a complaint and we go to the employer and we may believe the employer on some level but if they don't have the records we are typically going to rule against that employer and potentially that leads to an administrative penalty so again keep records um, I've seen records and I'm not joking. I mean, there's le different levels of sophistication with all businesses. I've literally seen records on napkins. I've seen records on, you know, scratch paper. Um, I would not recommend that, but it's something and it's better than nothing. So again, if you have the opportunity to take advantage of some type of electronic record keeping system, I would recommend that, but you do need to keep records and for those of you that follow the legislature there have been some proposals to expand that two-year requirement to three years to five years so um, that may be something that again comes into play in 2021 but right now it's two years and you do have to keep those records so please do that and like i said you'll avoid avoid a penalty from our office and we always offer if you want to have us come in and look at your records and tell you what your doing right tell you what you're doing wrong we offer that um, and again trying to help people get on the right track and make sure that they're doing what they need to do and we're again more than happy to do that that's a little bit limited now with COVID-19 but 
we still have investigators out in the field and there's ways to make things work and we can certainly do that. So Nevada law too, uniforms, um, if it's a specific business uniform that identifies the business, the business has to provide that. Um, now there's exceptions to that. So the one I always use is, you know, if the employer says you need to wear a pair of black boots that aren't very, you know, unique, um, typically the employee would have to provide those black boots and wear those black boots and wouldn't be reimbursed by the employer for those. But we're seeing a lot of cases now where employers have provided uniforms and the employer is employees either being laid off or they quit. And now surprise deductions for uniforms are, are appearing on the paycheck stub. Again, Nevada law is very specific. Um, if it clearly identifies the employee with the business, the business has to pay for that uniform. So um, just a healthy reminder on that because we are seeing that more and more and more. Um, payments, Nevada law requires at least a semi-monthly payment to employees and to maintain the same scheduled paydays. A lot of issues on this topic in the past four or five months. Totally understandable with businesses who don't know how they're going to make the payroll, don't know who they're going to keep on week to week. Uh, we have been working with some of those employers to try and come up with solutions and resolutions. On the other side, um, the worst case scenario for us is we get a call on a Friday afternoon at 435 and I've had this call that I can't make my payroll. I'm not going to be able to make payments. What can I do? Um, again, strict interpretation of the law is you have to make that payment semi-monthly and you have to pay those employees semi-monthly. And again, if it was intentional, that might lead to some type of administrative penalty. But I just encourage you try to stick to those legal requirements and if it's a situation where you know you're not going to be able to do it it's better to let our office know so that we can help you work through it and contact the employees and let them know what's coming and potentially avoid administrative penalties and avoid penalties even to the employees but seeing quite a few issues um, with that and again just employers and businesses not being able to make their payroll but the quicker you let us know, the better off you'll be. So the pay stub, again, itemized list of deductions. Um, pay stubs can be electronic. So the labor commissioner, there is a regulation package sitting over at the Legislative Council Bureau. I don't know if it's gonna go anywhere just given the timing, but there is still a provision in the regulations where an employee can request a paper check. And so we still see a claim probably once every three to four months where an employee is requesting a paper check and the employer says, well, I pay my other 99 employees electronically through direct deposit. Why do I have to issue a paper check? Well, the law still says that you do. Trying to fix that, again, I don't know where that's gonna go. Um, but we do try and resolve those issues through some type of a happy medium. Let me just put it that way. Um, but that is still a requirement. If somebody does request a paper check, technically by law, you do have to give them a paper pay stub and paycheck. So just be aware of that. Breaks and lunches, a lot of issues with breaks and lunches over the past four to five months. Um, do I have to give employees breaks? Do I have to give them lunches? You know, we were closed for three months. We're now back open. Do I have to provide, you know, a lunch of a half an hour? Do I have to provide a break? My employees are telling me that they don't want to take a break. They don't want to take a lunch. They want to work, you know, the full eight hours or more. Um, the labor commissioner has the ability to grant an exemption for breaks and lunches to an employer. We have a form on our website where you can request that. And it's a pretty simple process. What I look at when I look at those is what type of business are you running? Do the employees agree with the purpose of not having breaks and lunches? Did they sign off on it? Do you have a policy that says that? And we are more than happy to grant those. We don't grant them all the time, but if the employer, let me put it this way, has their ducks in a row 
and they know their business and they know their employees and the employees agree to it and sign off on it and there's a policy we will grant those the other thing we're seeing is obviously just with all the guidance on the health side of not being in big groups or not going certain places there's a lot of employers coming to our office and saying do i have to allow my employee to leave the building during lunch because I don't want them going to, you know, wherever and potentially exposing themselves to somebody else and then coming back to my business and potentially exposing the other employees in the business. So my counsel on that is you certainly can have requirements where you limit somebody from not leaving the building, but you need to make sure that they are aware of that and they sign off on that. Now, there's there's limits to that and, uh, you know, don't mean to laugh, but I mean, I've literally had questions where I've had employers say, I don't want my employee to leave, you know, the premises. I also don't want them to go home to their family. Um, now, that's getting a little bit extreme and certainly the labor commissioner can't support something like that. And, you know, there may be variations on that depending upon if it's a residential worker or something like that. But you certainly can have a requirement where you ask your employees to stay on the premises. Again, they need to be aware of that. They need to sign off on that um, so that there's not an issue. And, you know, that could lead to other issues, too, down the road of potentially, you know, keeping somebody on the premises and not allowing them to leave. But, again, the Labor Commissioner supports that as long as the employees are aware of it and know about it. So, Again, issues I never thought I would see in my tenure as the labor commissioner, but certainly issues that are coming up. The other issue is if you keep them there on the premises, and this gets into the health side of things and the OSHA side of things, is you better make sure that if there's a cafeteria or lunchroom that you advise them about social distancing and what those types of rules are, um, because we have seen situations where the employee will complain to us saying I was required to stay at the business during lunch. There's 20 people in the cafeteria. There's no social distancing. There's no this or that. And for those types of issues, we will forward those to OSHA to potentially take a look at. But again, if you're going to have a practice like that, make sure the employee is aware. If you want to seek an exemption, the form is on our website, and I'll give you more information at the end about our website, and you can certainly request that from the Labor Commissioner. So the final one on this page, employee terminated or they resign or they quit. So if you're going to terminate an employee, the law is pretty clear. It has to be paid. They have to be paid within three days. The Labor Commissioner did pass a regulation package last year, last December, December 2019, that any of the time periods that we're talking about three days five days, whatever, are business days. So I had been interpreting the law that way since I became labor commissioner to provide some flexibility to employers because you do have those situations where somebody is terminated on a Thursday or a Wednesday and you have that weekend break in there. So complying with the law on a Saturday or Sunday was just not possible. But I will tell you that the issue of paying somebody within three business days, once you terminate them, our office takes that very, very seriously. And we have seen probably over 150 claims since March on that issue where an employee has been fired and they have not been paid within the three business days. Technically, the law says that for each day they're not paid a penalty accrues basically their same pay rate accrues up to 30 days and so you can have a situation and for those of you that have heard me talk about this before you can have a situation situation where somebody's owed literally like 15 dollars and because they weren't paid within three days it goes up and up and up and at the end of 30 days they're owed three or four hundred dollars now in my opinion, that's a ridiculous result, and that's probably not what the law intended. But again, if you're going to terminate somebody, and obviously the labor commissioner understands that with everything that has gone on in the past few months, that there may have been days where you didn't know um, that you were going to have to terminate somebody or lay somebody off. And again, we try to be reasonable in terms of enforcement, but 
please try and comply with that requirement. And again, if you're not going to be able to make that payment within three business days, you need to let the employee know so that they don't come running to our office. And this is one of those sections where, believe it or not, employees know about this and it is a common claim and complaint, as well as the next one that if an employee resigns or they quit, you have to pay them within seven business days or their next regularly scheduled pay period. Employees know about this, so please make every effort to comply with these sections because, again, the worst situation that we want to have is where you not only owe the employee money, but you also owe them penalties um, for maybe just not understanding the law or just not having things in place. Um, but I always say, if you're going to fire somebody, make sure you have that paycheck ready. And if it's somebody that you know you do not want to have come back in the building, mail that check, certified mail, do whatever you need to do. Um, but please try and comply with these sections because, again, the, the downside of it is the penalty side and potentially the administrative penalty side um, can be pretty severe, again, for just a small amount of wages. So let's go ahead and go to the next slide, Carlos. So I'm not gonna go through all of this. Um, these were the 2019 bills that passed. I will tell you the second topic on here, Assembly Bill 132, the marijuana testing bill. We've probably seen in the past two months, probably 20 claims to our office about marijuana testing and the bill, the bill was pretty vague in terms of enforcement. So again, the labor commissioner is kind of silent on who really enforces this, but a lot of claims to our office. And I will tell you it's on the retail side of things where an employee applied for a position at such and such store. Um, they got tested for marijuana and they didn't get the job. And then the email or the complaint comes to our office and they say, why do I have to be tested for a job that's just this or just this? And um, so, again, we work through those on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, I would advise you to take a look at that bill, Assembly Bill 132. We also have some guidance on our website about it, but that's an issue that seems to be popping up for whatever reason a lot in the past few months, and whether it's just people being hired in different industries or people going back to work, but seeing a lot of employers now kind of using that um, testing ability, um, maybe to weed employees out or to screen employees from getting employment. Um, again, we're happy to give you guidance on that, but just be aware of that and kind of know what the requirements are. And if you're gonna have positions where you're absolutely gonna take the stance that they have to pass a drug test because it involves operating equipment, or a safety position or something like that, make sure you have that clearly defined in your position descriptions and in your policy. Um, but just want to make you aware of that, that's, that it's an issue that's out there and we're seeing a lot of it right now. So just be aware of that. Um, the last line here, Senate Bill 493, the Employee Misclassification Task Force, um, that has still not been appointed for those of you that are wondering. So obviously, with the events of COVID-19, some things got delayed. That bill was intended to study, have a task force that studied the independent contractor issue, which is not gonna go away. So our neighbor to the West, California, for those of you that have been following some of those cases over there um, involving Assembly Bill 5 and Uber and some of the other companies um, sued to stop the enforcement of Assembly Bill 5, so that's still kind of up in the air, but the independent contractor issue is also not gonna go away, but just so you know, that task force has not been appointed, and as we go into the legislative session starting February 2021, I would anticipate that this topic will be back on the agenda. So let's go ahead and go to the next slide, Carlos. So again, bulletins and guides, um, our office puts out quite a few bulletins and guides. Um, some are required by law, some we just put out so that we can give employers information and knowledge. So again, these are at www.labor.nv.gov. So please go on our website, you can print these out, they're free. Um, again, and we keep expanding on these and 
Every session, um, the legislature adds more requirements to our office for uh, mandatory bulletins, and then again, we try and publish kind of optional guides on bills and information. So again, that employers can kind of know what they need to do and where they're going. So let's go ahead and go to the next slide, Carlos. So required postings, these are the required postings by law. Um, I will bring up a point here for those of you that are operating a business that have received that solicitation and there's several companies out there that advertise and they make it seem really scary. Like if you don't have these required postings that the labor commissioner is gonna come after you and by paying $1,000 to this company, you can get all the required postings from the labor commissioner. Um, you certainly have the option of going down that road, but we have them for free on our website. Again, www.labor.nv.gov. They're there, they're free. Um, I'm actually working with our attorney general right now um, looking into some of those companies because it borders um, on some level on false advertising, not knowing if I'll ever be able to do anything about it, but um, charging $1,000 for, for posters that you can get for free doesn't seem right to me. So just wanted to bring that up in case any of you um, have ever received that. And how I get wind of it is an employer calls me and says, you know, Shannon, do I have to pay this to get these posters? And I say, no, they're free. Um, just go on our website and you can find them right there. So let's go ahead and go to the next slide, Carlos. And the next one, Carlos. So back to COVID-19 and um, the leave issue. So Senate Bill 312 passed by the legislature last session required paid leaves for employers of uh, 50 or more employees they had to provide paid leave to those employees basically it amounted to 40 hours um, throughout a benefit year so that bill took effect january 1st 2020 and there was a 12-page advisory opinion that i wrote on that bill because um, there definitely was some gaps um, in that bill so senate bill 312 really became an issue when the COVID 19 public health emergency really hit in the middle of March. So the additional guidance that the labor commissioner put out was that an employee certainly could use paid leave um, if they were subject to some type of a quarantine or a health situation. Um, but if it was an official government quarantine, and again, we're talking an official government quarantine, not a stay at home order, that that employee should not be penalized when it came to Senate Bill 312. So this was the initial guidance that came out in March, uh, middle of March from the Labor Commissioner. Um, certainly wanted to make sure that as we were learning more about COVID-19, that if there was an instance where an employee, again, was exhibiting symptoms or some type of a quarantine or felt that they needed to quarantine, that that option for that paid leave could be available. Um, what made this all interesting was that if you were an employer that was not providing paid leave prior to January 1st, 2020, the law said that an employee was not entitled to it um, until 90 days. So obviously when we had some of those first shutdowns in the middle of March, there were employees that never got to use um, their accrued paid leave because the business shut down or, you know, whatever reason, um, they were laid off prior to the 90 days. So we've again been working with employers on that issue and as they bring employees back um, on reinstating the leave and Senate Bill 312 talked about, you know, a certain reinstatement within 90 days and to have that leave reinstated. So again, been working through that issue with employers. Um, one of the other issues with Senate Bill 312, and we have seen a lot of claims and complaints about it, is under Nevada law, there is no requirement to pay out paid leave. Now, if an employer has an agreement or a contract or a collective bargaining agreement, they were automatically kind of exempt from some of the requirements of Senate Bill 312 anyway in terms of paid leave, and typically those exemptions those employers were already providing. 40 hours or more of paid leave, but with businesses closing, with employees being laid off, and obviously, you know, I'm not gonna get into specifics about it, but knowing what the unemployment situation is in Nevada, and it's been in the news and the delays of, 
you know, the unemployment division processing unemployment. There's employees who are looking for income. They're looking at their sick leave balances. They're looking at their vacation balances and saying, why can't I be paid out for that? Under Nevada law, there is no requirement to pay out that paid leave. However, the labor commissioner has always said, if you have a contract agreement or a collective bargain agreement saying you are gonna pay out that leave, we will enforce it. So a lot of employers have gotten caught kind of in this catch 22 where they unilaterally decided to change their paid leave requirements because of COVID-19 and change how their employees used leave, banked leave, accrued leave, rolled it over, and quite frankly, how some of them paid it out to their employees. Unfortunately, on occasion, they did not tell the employees that. So when the employee was laid off or the employee was fired, um, they go back to the employer and say, I wanna be paid out for my sick leave or my paid leave. Um, that's been the policy for the past 10 years. And the employer says, well, we changed our policy. You have every right to change your policy. You just need to let those employees know. And we've had a lot of cases and a lot of claims coming in on that issue. Um, again, trying to work with the employers, you certainly have a right to change the policy, but make sure those employees know about it. Because if every other year prior to this year, um, they knew people or some employers had a practice where they would pay out kind of like a bonus, some of the vacation leave that wasn't used, and then all of a sudden that stopped. Again, have the right to do that, but just make sure the employee knows because when the employee is surprised or the employee thinks that there's something wrong or they're not being treated fairly or not being treated like they were in the past, that's when it comes to our office. So again, just please inform your employees, make sure they know what the paid leave requirements are, how you're gonna track their leave, and if you're gonna pay it out. So go ahead and go to the next slide, Carlos. So I'll go through this fairly quickly, I already touched on some of these topics, but again, just some basic employer information for employees and employers in the state of Nevada. One of the big ones that I will hit on this one is the second one, can you decrease the rate of pay or change the rate of pay? Yes, under Nevada law, you absolutely have the right to do that, but you do have to give a written notice and we interpret that as seven business days. So we've seen a lot of claims and complaints coming in of my hours have been changed, my pay has been changed. The first question we ask is, were you, given notice in writing, did your employer tell you? Um, some cases, yes, some cases, no. But you get, again, as an employer, have every right to reduce the hours and to reduce the pay. The hours, technically, you don't have to put that in writing, but I still recommend that because that's kind of the basic employment agreement. But when it comes to wages, if you're gonna decrease those wages, you have to provide a seven-day notice Again, we interpret that as business days. Um, so please try and comply with that. And again, just changing the pay structure, I always recommend that you do that in writing and have the employee sign off on it because then they know exactly what the change is gonna be, when it's gonna take effect. And if there is a claim and complaint, um, then obviously there's backup, there's records, um, different things like that so that we can then say, hey, you know, the employee complied with the law, this claim is baseless and we can close the claim. But again, knowing that this is going on a lot right now, um, changes in pay, changes in pay structure, again, put it in writing, 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 I cannot emphasize um, that enough. And I've been saying this more and more lately is this is an opportunity for employers and employees to kind of re-engage in the employer and employee relationship and to go back and look at your policies and to have your employer employer and employee sign off on things on both sides and to raise issues on both sides so that everybody kind of knows where they stand. And again, knowing that some of these events and some of these working conditions are not anything that anybody anticipated, but again, just go back and make sure that everybody's on the same page and that certainly eliminates um, the avenue for claims and complaints. So. I'll just touch on this really quickly because again, it gets into more of the health side of things, but 
a lot of just questions of can I deny my employees vacation? Can I tell them not to take a vacation? Because again, I don't want them traveling to potentially exposing themselves to whatever. Um, you know, my advice as the labor commissioner is as the employer, you certainly have a right to dictate when an employee takes leave um, and to approve it or not approve it. I always recommend trying to work through those situations on an informal level. Um, but again, back to my point about having those discussions with your employees and um, having kind of just the overall framework of this is what the latest guidance is from the federal government, Centers for Disease Control. This is the latest guidance from the state of Nevada in terms of travel. Um, those seem to be changing on a daily basis sometimes. So. Again, I'm not going to speak as a health professional because I'm not, but, you know, this is one of those areas where it does kind of come into the labor commissioner's office and, you know, we tell employers that, you know, you certainly need to have that conversation with your employee and at the end of the day, you do have the right to approve or not approve leave. Now that does become a little bit fuzzy when we talk about Senate Bill 312 because Senate Bill 312 said, an employee could take paid leave for whatever reason and didn't have to provide the reason. The advice from the labor commissioner is you still have a right to be a supervisor. You still have a right to be a manager. You need to have a policy in place. And yeah, the law might say that, but you still can put something in place that says, you know, I require you to request leave three days in advance or different things like that. Um, so again, go back, have those policies in place and stay up to date with the latest public health guidance and those types of things. If you have employees that you are requiring to travel for work, know that as an employer, you know, they may have to self quarantine or they may have to telework. And for those employers that have that ability to provide that to their employees, you know, you need to offer that and hopefully, you know, that works. In some cases that does, some cases it doesn't. There's just some businesses that don't have that ability to offer telework or administrative leave to their employees and different things like that. But just know that if they're going to be traveling for work that you're requiring it, um, you need to have that in the back of your mind that you may have to offer some, you know, different working arrangements or things like that if they do come upon a situation where they're exhibiting symptoms or they have to quarantine and you know, maybe allow them to telework and, and different things like that. The other issue, and again, I'm not, a, not gonna tell anybody individually how to run their lives or run their businesses, but we are seeing more of this too, is you know, as things are opening up and there's people that have Facebook and there's people that have Twitter, um, I've had questions from employers that you know, I saw my employee's Twitter account or I saw my employee's Facebook account and I'm just saying this as an example, and this is a real example, that they posted a picture of themselves at the lake with 30 people drinking beer. Nobody had masks on, nobody was socially distanced. And again, putting aside how anybody individually feels about all of this, the question to me is, you know, can I prevent them from coming into the office? Can I fire them? What can I do? Again, as an employer, you have a right to take whatever actions you feel are necessary to prevent. Um, and the term at the federal level is a direct threat. So COVID-19 is deemed to be a direct threat. So if you have the ability to allow that person to telework or ask them to take paid leave, or in some cases take unpaid leave, um, you have the right to do that. You also have the right to terminate employment and I have used that phrase more in the past six months than I've ever used that phrase as the labor commissioner, and that doesn't make me happy, but there are some situations here where you as the employer do have the right to terminate employment. Nevada is an at-will employment state. I would still recommend that you do have some type of documentation, some type of notice um, when you take that action, but you do have the right to terminate employment and I'm seeing a lot of employers, good or bad. So we certainly have the COVID-19 public health situation and the guidance from the state and the federal government on quarantining, getting testing, different things like that. There are always gonna be people that take advantage of situations. 
So there are employees who are claiming that everything is COVID related. So not showing up for work, you know, being out for a week at a time, oh, I'm sick, not going to the doctor. Again, you as the employer have the right to be a manager. You do have the right to ask for doctor's notes. Again, within reason, um, if you do have an employee that's been out for a specific situation related to COVID-19, you do have a right to ask for a test. And again, these are situations that, including myself as a manager and supervisor, I never thought I would have to be in, but this is the world we're in now, and you do have a right to ask for those types of things. So again, make sure that your supervisors, managers, all the way up and down the line know that they can do that. And again, have policies in place because this kind of eliminates some of the issues um, that can come up and it prevents, again, situations from happening before they get into a messy and complaint situation. And for those of you that have dealt with the labor commissioner's office, you know, we tend to take a moderate view of enforcement and again, try and work with employers and find a, a good resolution. Um, if you don't handle some of these situations right at the start, you potentially are looking at claims and complaints from the Nevada Equal Rights Commission or to the Federal Department of Labor and again, their approach towards enforcement is a little bit different than mine, um, good or bad. But, you know, if you have questions too on any of these issues, make sure you reach out to us first, again, to avoid a problem rather than having one happen for no reason. So let's go ahead and go to the next slide, Carlos. So just a reminder, and I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, you know, when this all started, I was asked again, towards the minimum wage, labor laws, were you gonna suspend the laws? Were you gonna, you know, I don't have that power. Um, our office has tried to be very, very reasonable when it comes to extensions, when it's come to time periods, working with employers, and we will continue to do that, but we will continue to enforce Nevada labor laws. And I can say that I have been extremely pleased with how the majority of Nevada employers have handled this situation and wanting to do the right thing. There's always going to be those few that, again, on the employee side as well, that'll take advantage of things. But the labor laws are still in enforced, and we all are still enforcing them. Again, trying to be very reasonable. Um, and what I always look to is, was it intentional? Um, did you know about it? Did you do it more than once? Um, those types of things. But we don't just go after employers and we don't just go after big cases or different things like that. I mean, we just don't have the staff to do that. It's claim and complaint driven. And like I said, really trying to work with the employer side of things, getting through this and, you know, on this side too, the labor commissioner side, learning different things along the way. And, um, you know, as we do go into a, another legislative session here in 2021, uh, maybe bringing some of those issues up during that session and we'll obviously work with groups like the chamber and all different sides but there's certainly some things that you know from this perspective that maybe we need to to kind of fix going forward and and we'll work through that but just just know that we are still enforcing the labor laws and they will always be enforced until somebody tells me not to so let's go ahead and go to the next slide Carlos. So telework guide, our office put this out, obviously with more people teleworking. And again, some employees have that, and I don't want to call it a luxury. Um, for some it is, and I will just say that honestly. Um, but we put this guide out because as telework, especially for businesses that weren't doing it before, became more of the norm, we started to see more and more issues. So I'll give you some examples. So you know, an employee logs on to the system and they're working through a virtual network. The network shuts down and they can't get on the network for an hour or two hours. Do they still have to be paid for that two hours? So I'm just giving you some examples. Um, one claim we had was where the employee was teleworking and they had to buy Microsoft Office. Could they get reimbursed for Microsoft Office? So we put out this guide and it's kind of a big picture guide, letter of the law type of guide. But if you're gonna have employees teleworking, just make sure that they know what they're required to do. Make sure that they know the type of equipment 
that they're going to be required to purchase or not purchase, what's going to be provided, what the working hours are going to be. Um, this area, I envision as we go forward, there'll probably be more and more claims and complaints about this. And now with the school situation coming into play, um, this is going to become more of an issue. But again, have the boundaries mar marked out. Um, know what you want from those employees. Know what's expected of them. And I certainly have employees who are teleworking as a manager myself. And again, I don't monitor every minute of their day, but there are very specific marks that they need to meet during the week and very specific requirements that they need to document. And this whole situation, like I said, it's ripe for issues, um, good or bad. But I just bring up a couple of those examples, and those are just some of the few. But when it comes to equipment and the networks, make sure you have that outlined and make sure you have that employee aware of what the requirements are. And again, uh, whatever you need to have them sign off in terms of policies or agreements, make sure that they do that. So let's go ahead and go to the next slide, Carlos. So this is an issue that started to pop up as well, um, releases of liability as a condition of coming back to employment. So as businesses started opening back up, they were asking employees to sign agreements saying, if I get sick at work or whatever happens at work related to COVID-19, I agree not to sue, I agree not to hold the employer liable. Um, those started to pop up, I wanted to say probably mid-June. So we put out some guidance on this topic. The main point I'm going to hit about this is the workers' compensation side. Under Nevada law, you cannot have an employee waive their rights to workers' compensation benefits. So that is an absolute no-no. And that is the first kind of line in this guide. You know, the law is changing. So Nevada, in the last special session passed Senate Bill 4, which mainly applies to casinos and different things like that, but kind of a limit on liability. Um, there's potential that that issue is going to be addressed at the federal level as well, and possibly in the next legislative session in terms of how it gets expanded or doesn't get expanded. But if you're going to try and have an employee sign a release of liability, if you have the opportunity to talk to a labor attorney or a human resources organization, you know, they can probably give you some guidance on that topic, but the labor commissioner put out this guidance basically to say, you probably shouldn't do it. And to the extent you are going to do it, um, it may not be enforceable. And here's some of the reasons why. So again, you know, an issue that did come up and how these came up is a claim came into the labor commissioner's office and the screenshot of the release of liability from such and such a company. And I will tell you too, in this environment, that employee then went to one of the media outlets in Las Vegas and showed the screenshot. And it was on the paper the next day of, oh, this company is requiring employees to sign this agreement. And is this legal? And so again, just be cautious if you're gonna go down this road. And like I said, if you can get the advice of legal counsel and um, make sure you're on solid footing because they may not be enforceable down the road. Um, and again, that, that potentially causes issues for you as an employer. The other topic I would bring up here, and it's not under the jurisdiction of the labor commissioner, but severance packages. So probably had at least 25 just questions about severance packages. And again, the labor commissioner doesn't enforce them. Um, but we will look to situations if the severance agreement or package was negotiated in good faith. And we have seen several situations where there were severance agreements that were negotiated and the employer knew they were going out of business the next day. So we refer those to like the attorney general's office and in some cases potentially to the district attorney's office because then that becomes a question of good faith. And you know, having somebody enter an agreement under duress, which is a legal term, but I just throw that out there that, again, if you're going to do that, it's certainly legal. Um, a severance agreement is certainly legal, but um, please have the best intentions in mind and, and again, try and comply with the law and uh, make sure that if you're going to negotiate one, 
that you stick to the terms of the agreement and don't just do it to try and get rid of somebody or know that you're going bankrupt the next day and, um, you know, as a way of getting, getting out of it, let me just put it that way. So let's go ahead and go to the next slide, Carlos. So schools. So um, for those of you up in Northern Nevada, Washoe County Schools, they started two weeks ago with a mix of what they're now calling hybrid schools where kids are in school one day and they're not the next or there's rotating schedules um, based on just the distance learning or the public health situation. So the federal government um, who is responsible for enforcing the Families First Federal Coronavirus Response Act, FSCRA, um, which provided certain leave requirements under federal law. So under the federal emergency paid sick leave requirements, there was up to 80 day, eight, I'm sorry, 80 hours that were available to an employee based on very specific requirements. So the main one was there was an official quarantine or the employee tested positive or was having symptoms of COVID-19 or they had to care for somebody um, who had COVID-19. They did also add some language about closed schools. So this is when the schools were closed. So an employee was eligible to take up to 80 hours um, under the FFCRA to care for the child because of the school closure. Um, the rate of pay under the school closure requirement was two thirds of their normal pay rate. So the federal government kind of took that into account that, you know, because it's just a school closure, we don't want to pay the employee the full rate of pay that they may be due if they were taking it for an actual sick day. So they kind of made that made that trade off, let's put it that way. So they also expanded Family Medical Leave Act based on school closures and added an additional 10 weeks for employees if the schools were closed. So that situation kind of went through um, late March all the way through August and it's still in effect, but the question kept coming up and coming up and coming up is what about now are the schools open or are they closed? So the term that kept coming up was, well, it's a hybrid model. Is the federal government going to give us any guidance? So they finally did about a week and a half ago. And this is again available on our website. But essentially what the federal government said is that, you know, on the days when the school is open, um, you're basically not eligible to take that leave under the FFCRA on the days when the school is quote unquote um, not open to your child, it's still open, but they don't go into school that day and you have to stay home and take care of them and um, really mean that you're caring for that child during the day that you are eligible for leave under the FFCRA. So again, this is on our website and, you know, it's federal law, so it's not enforced by the Nevada Labor Commissioner, but these questions spill over and um, we're happy that they did finally provide some guidance on this. The issue of the choice, so your child can either go in person or they can do a remote learning situation and the parent affirmatively says, I want my child at home, I don't want them to go physically to school because I'm afraid that they might get exposed to something. Um, the federal government said, if you make that choice, that you are not eligible for leave under the FFCRA, so again, whether anybody agrees with that or doesn't agree with that, um, that is essentially what the federal government said is that if you affirmatively make that choice, that there is the option to send that child to school in person and you affirmatively say, I'm keeping them home, then you are not eligible for um, that FFCRA leave, which again is up to 80 hours or up to 10 weeks of Family Medical Leave Act. So they did make kind of a concession that if the school starts where it's open or it starts where it's closed. And basically um, the model changes, let's put it this way, um, and they're going to monitor it on a week by week basis. So up in Northern Nevada, they're monitoring the schools on a weekly basis. And you know, at one 
day they may be open, the next day um, they may be closed. And if that's a decision that the school district makes, um, that they did say, the federal government said you are eligible for FFCRA leave, and again, um, can take that leave. What I've recommended to employers and based on my conversations with the Federal Department of Labor is again, you know, ask those questions, document, you know, if you have an employer or employee saying, look, I don't want any of my employees to take any of this leave, um, you really can't do that. And if you, on the other side of it, if you have an employee who's saying, you know, I need to be at home um, five days a week, um, I don't want my child to go to school, um, I have to take care of them, you do have a right to say you're not eligible for this leave under the federal law. Now, again, I would recommend trying to work out something with that employee and whether it's telework or different things like that. But, you know, this is probably going to be an evolving situation as we get more into the school year and as more schools open up and more kids go back. But this is the guidance from the federal government. Um, on the state level, obviously, if the employee has paid leave under Senate Bill 312, you as the employer can allow them to take that leave for maybe some of these gap periods. Um, but, you know, specifically at the federal level and in terms of that kind of expanded sick leave and expanded family medical leave, these are the requirements when it comes to schools. And again, again expect that this situation is going to change um, as we go month to month and week to week. But certainly wanted to make sure that all of you were aware of this and um, you know, knew about it because this is going to come up more and more and more. So let's go ahead and go to the next slide, Carlos. So again, just links on our website. We have a whole COVID-19 tab on our website that has um, this information and a lot more information, not only from our side of things, the state side, but also from the federal side. Um, you know, it's been an interesting type of dynamic because the federal government passed some new laws those have kind of rolled out to the states to give the guidance and to, you know, kind of inform employers about those laws. So it's been an interesting few months for, for myself as the labor commissioner, because at the end of the day, I don't enforce federal law, but I also know that it's certainly something that our Nevada employers need to know about and need to comply with. So um, that balance has been interesting and um, continue to work on that. Um, on both sides, the federal side, state side, and, you know, working with organizations like the Chamber to try and give you the most up-to-date guidance that we have. When it comes to, like, the Centers for Disease Control, um, I just recommend monitoring that daily, weekly, because that seems to change. Same with the OSHA issues. Those seem to change daily, weekly, and they're very specific to very specific industries. And, you know, we can always guide you in the right direction, but there's just some of these areas where, where we just don't enforce. So go ahead and go to the next slide, Carlos. So our website, um, for those of you that have not seen our website, um, it's grown a lot in the past probably four or five years. A lot of information on there. Um, mail one, which is our general question. So mail one at labor.nv.gov. So you can send questions to that mailbox. I personally have been monitoring that mailbox since March, since all of this. So if you say, well, I wanna to talk to the labor commissioner and you're asking a question through that mailbox, you are talking to me. So it does not mean that I may not refer it to one of my investigators or to somebody else to answer your question, but just know when you send a question there, it is viewed by me. Um, so that has been an interesting experience for me, just seeing the range of questions and allowing me to kind of know on our side what we needed to do and some of the issues that I wanted to bring up to all of you today. And it's been very good. And um, as the commissioner, you know, that's my job and my responsibility is to make sure that our office functions properly and timely and to provide accurate information. So um, for those of you that have been on that mailbox and um, get a response within a 24-hour period or on a Sunday, it's because we are committed to doing that and we're committed to getting everybody, um, and I'm using that term generally, employers, employees, getting through this and getting to a point where, you know, um, we've learned some things and maybe some things that we can do better, but 
please know that we're here for you and are willing to help and willing to answer questions. And like I said it before, I'm not a gotcha type of person. I'm not a gotcha commissioner and our agency is not. So we're happy to help and we're happy to provide you guidance um, on any of these topics. And I will go ahead and stop there and see if there's questions and happy to answer them. Okay, excellent. Uh, Labor Commissioner Shannon Chambers, we so appreciate your uh, very thorough presentation today. This is Jen, you've just been a wealth of information. Um, we did have a question. Someone was asking if it's possible to post your PowerPoint online on our website or just send that out to the viewers and listeners today. Is that possible to share? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Excellent. So we can, uh, we'll connect with you after this and, and we'll make that happen and then we'll send that information out to, uh, to everyone on the line today. So uh, I, I just want to tell you again how much I appreciate your time today. You've just been uh, always so available to the Vegas Chamber and to our members and um, again, you're a wealth of information and we will do this again very soon because you covered a lot. <laughs> No, and I appreciate it, Mary Beth. And, you know, I was thinking to myself and not to ramble on here, but the last time I believe that I spoke to your group in person in Las Vegas was when there was the grasshopper invasion. Yes. So that seemed minor compared to this. <laughs> you know, grasshoppers, pandemics, you know. Everything. Yeah, you know. Yeah. So, all right. Well, thank you again. Uh, we appreciate you so much. And uh, you also gave us your contact information. So we'll make good use of that. Um, I also want to thank our webinar sponsors today, uh, SCE Federal Credit Union and the U UNLV Executive MBA program for their generous support. Thank you again, uh, Commissioner, and we will talk to you very soon. And thanks to everyone for joining us today. Great. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Okay. Bye-bye.